and I act for peanuts. <laughs> I have never gotten paid a single penny. <laughs> Even though I had two movies that went to Sundance. Imagine that. I don't get paid! So, if you are making a movie and you need an actor, as long as you feed me and treat me like a decent human being, I'll be there for you. Um, I'm a senior in high school. I was seven when I filmed that movie, I think, so it's been a few years. Um, and I'm going to major in vocal performance in college. So, uh. This lady is a singer. Right then. Um, I'm Betsy, and uh, I work in public health during the day. Well, I don't really have a job, but I've done cooking and custodial work most of my life. I'm a tired and a loving grandma. Uh, I own a limousine service and drive for the Chiefs. Uh, I'm not a cast member. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I am until I, I work in a video production company. <laughs> I was indispensable. I just want to say real quick, yes. Oh, with Tato. Yeah. I don't think he wants to say anything because he's probably a little bit embarrassed about his uh, English uh, communication skills, but Tato is a professional performer. He's a clown. Woo! He is a phenomenal musician, and uh, this man has a heart of gold. Uh, I wrote a poem for the, for the movie, and I called him and I said, hey man, um, is there any way possible that you can put some music to this poem? And he did, with a group of, a uh, couple of brothers who are here, and his son, and they put the music to the song, to the poem, and that song is going to be included in the movie. Woo! <laughs> So I just want to say there's some really important people that couldn't be here tonight because they've passed since we made the film. Um, Devin Danner, who played Patik. Uh, yes. I'm the father. Okay. Tell us about Devin. He's a big kid, and I thought he was incredible. Thank you. So my son was the little boy that was talking about the volcanoes and the uh, environment there on the stage in the church. Uh, he passed away in November. Um, he was becoming a pharmacist, and he was about a year and a half from being finished with that when he did pass. So it was awesome. He showed up as an extra. My whole family participated in the movie, but I don't think we made the cut. Uh, uh, but, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but I just want to come up and acknowledge that. Um, it was awesome to see everything. I appreciate you, uh, including my son. He didn't know anything about my son passing, uh, but he made the cut for being on uh, the play bill. So I do uh, appreciate you acknowledging that, yeah. that he was something special. So thank you. He showed up and, uh, as just an extra. And then again, someone who's the person who's supposed to play that his part was a little weird. And we were like, what about that kid? You couldn't say it was ours. He was so cute and amazing. So that was definitely. And then uh, Jeremiah Rotso, who played uh, Mr. Peacock, the uh, other henchman of, with, next to Eric, he passed. Uh, Paul Burns, who was the guy who got shot at the beginning. Uh, who am I leaving out? Oh, uh, Chris, Chris Moeller, who, uh, oh, other, other uh, parent of Trio, and also in the film a couple times. Ramon Armstrong, who played Luther, sadly. And most incredibly, Matt Stathis, who played Blitz. Uh, the bad guy. Uh, so we've lost all those people in the last 10 years and they're all really incredible, especially Matt and Ramon. Like, neither of them had done any acting and they're both fantastic. So I think they could have had careers. Other questions? <clears throat> right here. Yeah, I just uh, I wanted to ask about the writing process of this movie because, I mean, we, did, we also. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask specifically about a scene whenever. Uh, you're in the mall, right? You come across a, not even a dead body, an alive person being eaten by dogs. Um, I just wanted to ask, how does one get to the point of writing a scene like that? Like, how does that come to you? So that was that was a much more intricate scene. It was much longer. It went all through the mall. There was chasing and running and, and dialogue. 
And then we got there, and it was like 99 degrees, and there's black mold. So we were like, how about if he runs in, sees the guy, and runs out? Let's just get out of here as fast as fucking possible, because we're going to die. So that was the writing process. It was just like survival. Let's get out of here. That place uh, was called Indian Springs Mall. Yeah, Indian Springs Mall, if anybody Those remembers. Those places that were. Yeah. Uh, where I saw I, most of my movies. I, I witnessed a homicide in that place. I witnessed a guy getting his throat caught in that place. I was making a phone call. I had just graduated from the police academy in 1992. They had a, uh, one of those places where you can go and play video games and stuff like that. So I'm making a phone call to Venezuela to tell my family, I am now a brand new police officer. When a Cadillac drives by, pop, 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 I hope it's fire. <laughs> and I end up with And there was a throat cut? No. Okay. So the guy getting his cut throat right there. So uh, how did it feel going back to that place? How did it feel? Traumatized, demoralized, and mentally sodomized. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? That's how we get. Anyone else? Yes. Right back here. So I, I've heard a lot of talk about, uh, I'm going to characterize it as the role serendipity played in the riot and shooting process. Is there anything else notable where something in the unexpected happens that changed the course of the film to see what we have today? Betsy, do you, can you think of anything? Mentioning Eric is, is a good point because it gets back also to the writing thing you were saying where, where like, uh, I didn't really write this movie and Betsy and I didn't really write this movie. Like the, we, we, we had a script and then we mostly just threw it out when we realized how much better like the, the performers uh, were when they were bringing their own selves and their uh, history and their own dialogue to the scenes and so like Eric, for example, it was just uh, nothing henchman's role with just a few lines, but then Eric came along and he was so great and funny that he ended up being a whole subplot with his brother and his brother and his going into his drug fantasy. And like, so that was all just came out of Eric and meeting Eric. And so the whole movie basically was just one big long improvisation on a tight script. Anyone else? I will think about it, but I will ask. I think this might got it. Um, where does the film go next? This has certainly kind of cult classic status oh, thanks. all over it. So where does it go? Well, um, so two, two, are two things happening. One is um, the festival uh, route. So next is uh, Panic Fest. If you want to see it again, it's playing April nineteenth at uh, Screenlight Armor. Tell your friends. And uh, then it's going to be in Brazil, uh, a town called Porto Alegre. Um, and uh, for a festival called Fantaspoa, it's the biggest uh, genre festival in Latin America. So, um, so that's next month. And but then there's also distribution. It's there's no, right now there's no U.S. Uh, distribution or even interest, but it's actually being distributed internationally. Weirdly, like it, it's got a Japanese distributor now, and it's going to get a Japanese theatrical release in Tokyo and Osaka, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it might be playing in Japan and Europe before it even comes out here. So I'm trying to find U.S. distribution, but uh, it's going to be available everywhere else first. So. This will be great in Japan. Uh, yeah, I think so. I can't wait to take some. Yeah, I'll go to Japan and have it be the next Sunny Chiba and run through Tokyo in a job trip. Yeah. I call it, this is a Japanese movie. That's, a, that's true. Like, when we were shooting, the whole time he was saying, do you know who's going to love this movie? Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for bringing. Thank you so much. <laughs>